Welcome everyone, thanks for joining. We're gonna start here in a minute or two, wait for everyone to get into our webinar here, and then we'll get started. I see the numbers are increasing in our participant counts. Uh, every hundred, I will make another announcement. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a question came up, will this be recorded? It will be recorded, will be posted on our center website, which we'll be sharing a link to you here shortly. Thank you. Those of you joining here, thank you. Uh, we'll start shortly. We'll just wait for everyone else to get in our room here, our webinar, and then we'll get started. I see people are still joining, so we'll, we'll wait another minute or so. Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for all of you joining us really from throughout the country here. My name is uh, Joe Gogler. I direct the Public Health Center of Excellence on Dementia Caregiving and in honor of Alzheimer's Awareness Month and uh, National Family Caregivers Month. We are so thrilled to be providing this webinar uh, to you here today. Uh, our center has conducted multiple webinars here of the past several months, really excellent ones. We had a great series on cultural adaptation uh, of, of dementia caregiving approaches for public health, some other great uh, seminars too. But this one in particular, I am really excited about. And based on I, what I hope will be our robust participation today, um, I think you'll be excited uh, about too. And it's really talking about dissemination, implementation, and adaptation of evidence-based programs in dementia caregiving, and, and how do we strategize this from a public health perspective? So before we start, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. We acknowledge with gratitude the land itself and the people. We take to heart and commit through action to learn and honor the traditional cultural Dakota values, courage, wisdom, respect, and generosity. So our Public Health Center of Excellence, uh, we call it a PICO for short, um, is really designed to support state, tribal, and local public health agencies nationwide in developing their dementia caregiving focused programs and initiatives. And we really have three principal activities uh, uh, to do so. One is improving access to evidence-based programs and best practices. Two is really facilitating connections and serving as a liaison between public health agencies and many other organizations in this space. And then third, providing technical assistance related to how we can best support those who provide unpaid care to people living with dementia in our own communities. So I would like to personally welcome our presenters, uh, many of whom I have collaborated with, I see as great colleagues and I'm just thrilled to hear from today. We'll be having uh, Dr. Laura Gitlin, who's the Dean and Distinguished University Professor at Drexel University in the College of Nursing and Health Professions, Dr. Ken Hepburn. Um, he is in uh, the Emory School of Nursing. He also directs the Roybal Center for Dementia Caregiving Mastery. John Hobde, who's the founder and CEO of Healthcare Interactive, and then uh, Aaron Long, who's the team lead of Alzheimer's Disease Programs Initiative from the Administration for Community Living. I think all of these presenters are gonna provide us with really important key insights related to uh, adaptation, dissemination, and implementation of dementia care innovations. So thank you again for attending. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A um, uh, function on your Zoom screen. Uh, you can certainly use chat as well. And throughout the presentations today, if we have time, we'll address questions, but we certainly will do so at the end as well. Thanks again for attending. And uh, Elma, I believe I am done here. And now we go to the first speaker, correct? Dr. Gitlin? That's right. Very good. So I'm going to stop sharing. Laura, thanks again. And uh, thrilled to have you here today. Great. Thank you. Uh, let me just get my slides up. And there we go. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joe and, and Elma. I'm, I'm really excited about this and welcome everyone. I love the chats and 
seeing that's the beauty, right, of Zoom and uh, having uh, to being able to engage everybody from around the country. Uh, so the title of my talk is Knocking on One Door at a Time, Dissemination Challenges Moving at One Particular Program that I've worked with with my teams called COPE, Care of Older People with Dementia and Their Environments. Uh, and that really is uh, my theme here about the uh, experience of dissemination in the United States. So I really look forward to sharing the program and the dissemination efforts as well as a discussion about this. So let me move forward. I first just want to acknowledge many funding sources for those of you involved in intervention development. It really takes many different funding sources. And I, I just want to say to a great welcome and great to have Erin on the uh, panel because the Administration on Community Living has been one of the key funding sources for replication and dissemination and implementation. And we're learning a lot by the agencies that ACL is funding uh, for COPE and some of the other projects. But I wanted to start, um, I'm an interventionist. Many of you know, I've been around for a while. 30 some years, I have a lot of different interventions that I've developed with my teams. Uh, it, this is a team sport, both in terms of intervention development and definitely in terms of dissemination. And uh, we could add lots of other programs here from everybody else on this panel and outside this panel, but these are just a few of the programs that I have worked on and continue to work on, and they're in different stages of um, testing and then moving them into dissemination and implementation. And overall, my experience is really true to the uh, Institute on Aging comment that it takes uh, 17 years. I find that it can take up to 10 years from a um, publication of efficacy to having anybody even interested in the program. Uh, and that's after knocking on different doors and maybe 20 uh, up out to 25 years to begin to test how it can be implemented. And that's only if the stars align and what has to align. So for any one of these programs and for the COPE program, which is what I'm gonna focus on, these are the questions that each of the programs have to be simultaneously evaluated on. Before, uh, and, and, that, and these questions are what different kinds of stakeholders use to judge whether they want to take your program and implement it, whether that be an age, a community agency, a healthcare system, uh, as well as stakeholders, meaning end users, uh, the interventionists, as well as uh, people living with dementia and their caregivers. So what's the level of evidence? Who does it work for? Who, uh, what, were, what are the samples in which the study was tested on so that we know that it works for a wide diversity of individuals with different kinds of um, uh, diagnoses and stages of disease, as well as race and ethnicity and so forth. Uh, how relevant is the outcome and what is done in the intervention to different stakeholders? What's the need? Is the need for this program uh, and what its outcomes are about? How does a program fit into workflows within a health system uh, and or community-based system? Where's sustainability at? What's the payment model? Well, how long will training be and what's the cost and how is training being delivered? Are staff even available to deliver the intervention? Uh, what kinds of training in dementia care do they need period before they even get to your protocol? What kinds of adaptations are needed for the setting or for the uh, targeted uh, community uh, that the program would be implemented in? And by the way, does the developer, myself and members of my team, do we have the time the funds and the interest to even go on this journey of dissemination implementation. So all of these questions and uh, possibly others are ones that are applied to each of the programs here uh, and therefore they're in different levels of success of implementation. So um, let me tell you a little bit about um, the uh, COPE program and speak specifically about some of the dissemination challenges of this particular program, uh, which is the experience, by the way, of practically all of my programs. So first of all, we built COPE um, to be very flexible because we built it from the lens of implementation from the beginning. So basically, COPE involves a combination of home and phone sessions. The number of sessions depends upon need, but it's up to 10 occupational therapy sessions and two to three nurse sessions. I can get into more detail 
about why OT and nursing, but to say that this is a clinical oriented intervention. It's designed to provide, if you go down to content, disease education, stress reduction techniques, hands-on skills training and communication, test simplification, environmental redesign, and the management of common medical concerns that are matter most to families caring for someone with dementia. So uh, it, it, we know exactly, and I think the uh, dissemination implementation success depends on knowing who's your target, and we know exactly who benefits from COPE. COPE isn't needed by all caregivers. But many times COPE is needed after someone's been in savvy, for example, Ken, or REACH, uh, because this is hands-on skills training. And so we're just very clear about that. It involves three phases. Again, I'm not gonna go into detail, but the novelty and the importance of this approach and why it is attractive to stakeholders of any kind is that we assess not only what a person can't do, caregiver and person living with dementia, but what they can do and understand executive function and other um, matches between function and the environment so that we can very di purposely direct um, families of how to set up their environment to be successful. In terms of flexibility, we have a set of assessment tools, but when we work with an agency, we say that they can use any assessment tools that they use as long as they assess the domains that we have tested to be very, very important. So we've built in other kinds of um, flexibility that I can explain if there's questions later. Just having trouble advancing my slide, there we go, okay. Um, so I just wanna say that uh, COPE is definitely theory-based. Again, I'm not gonna go into the theory, but the theories, multiple theories that work together in different ways, but they all lead to five treatment principles. So that when we implement um, COPE, it's these five principles that we're looking for that are maintained. We don't care how many sessions, we recommend a minimum of three to four sessions uh, be uh, delivered and that the first two are in the home. Uh, but if the approach is not family-centered, tailored, culturally relevant, problem-solving oriented, and skills and knowledge are taught through active engagement, then you're not doing COPE. And we're very clear about that. Uh, and that's why a fidelity to these principles in different ways is important. Um, just want to give you, again, a high level, multiple uh, uh, randomized trials resulting in positive outcomes, less upset for caregivers, improved well being, improved caregiver confidence for the person living with dementia, reduced behavioral symptoms, reduced physical dependence, reduced uh, enhanced engagement and the detection of underlying treatable medical issues, particularly from the nurse component. And in recent papers, we're showing health system uh, cost savings, particularly in hospitalization and medication. So the outcomes are growing, uh, but also robust. So uh, what does it mean to, be, uh, to get ready for dissemination? What do I have to do and my teams have to do to really engage in getting COPE out to real families. And here are just some of the key things that we have had to engage in. We, first of all, have to minimize dependence on the developers. Uh, otherwise, I'll be and my teams will be knocking on people's doors and training and training takes, you know, could take a couple of days to a week. So developing an online self-paced training program has been paramount. And in doing that, identifying training competencies and requirements, what's the price structure for different people, settings, countries, independent providers, students who want to learn this, how do we set up in our institution enrollment procedures for people to be trained, what is the licensure stru structure, these are all considerations, and I try to keep a similar model for COPE as with my other programs, but sometimes there's nuances. Uh, best practice from implementation science is that you do have training, you do have a manual, of course, but that you also need coaching calls and you have to work with agencies to determine how fidelity can be enhanced and monitored. And then within the institution to drive people to accept your program, what's your market and outreach strategy? 
Uh, that's where a particular dissemination models can be helpful, but I haven't found one magic one that carries er covers everything. Uh, we're playing around with different strategies. And then also clarity. We're very clear and keep um, making more clear what adaptations are allowable and who are the targeted populations? Who is this right for? Uh, and so as we grow the evidence, we have to put it out there uh, as part of our dissemination. And then we also have to be very clear, and this is all part of what I just call being dissemination ready. What do agencies need to do to prepare? There's a lot to do to prepare to use an evidence-based program. And how are they going to supervise people who are trained to short fidelity? And what are their costs? And being very clear and transparent about that is very critical I have found in, in doing this. Laura, yeah. two more minutes. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna wrap up by talking about some of the key challenges and I've organized them uh, in terms of uh, the, the human factor. Real life interferes with dissemination implementation. I got an email yesterday from a, a fantastic a partner in Australia who was about to launch another a tailored activity program throughout Australia. They have serious health problems, have to drop out and turn back millions of dollars. That's what happens. You train agencies and then with COVID, they close down and they don't have the staffing in order to um, provide this. So a lot of energy, a lot of time and human factors are uh, really considerations of how you proceed. Organizational factors. Is there mission alignment? Are organizations ready? Do they have the infrastructure? They have to have a referral mechanism, a marketing strategy. We have to come up with the value proposition uh, and help them think through how to market. What are the right words from the literature, from the evidence to outreach to families who represent different experiences, race, ethnicities, and ways of thinking about caregiving? We all know about the historical factors. They all slow down, interfere with, complicate, change the course of dissemination. And then there's a whole host of scaling factors that we continue to have to think through. Level of dependency on the developer. Uh, how much, I, I, I want this to be all free of me. I want this out there. Our intervention we're clear about is clinically intensive. So you have to have the right um, providers workforce to do this, and that may limit uh, scaling. Um, more complexity in an intervention, then it may not be uh, available to the entire world. Multi-component uh, approaches have been found to be most effective, but again, they're challenging then to implement. Workforce, believe it or not, some states do not have, and health systems do not employ um, uh, OTs. I learned that some of the VAs that are picking this up that in their home care, they don't have OTs, which I, I think is remarkable in their geriatric care practices. Sustainability is a challenge. And in, in the United States, the methodology for dissemination, at least until I can, somebody help me, is knocking on one door at a time. And that's uh, where we're at. And then in conclusion, I just wanna say, these are the questions that I'm at, I ask. What is the future of the COPE program? It has great outcomes, people love it. The state of Connecticut just picked it up and will be entering it into its Medicaid waiver, but who will own COPE and sustain it? Is there a centralized organization who will take it? How best do we integrate COPE into the training of health professionals? Uh, and as we develop more protocols and other ways of advancing the evidence, how do we integrate it back into a program that people are currently using? And with that, I will, that's the story of COPE. <laughs> it's an evolving story and I turn it back to you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gillen. What a great way to kick off this uh, exciting event here today. We'll now turn to another uh, master designer, developer and disseminator of dementia care interventions, Dr. Ken Hepburn. And Ken, please take it away. Um, Thank you, Joe. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for organizing this. Um, I think I'm sharing my screen. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk about implementation, adaptation, and fidelity management of a single evidence-based behavioral intervention. In this case, uh, the intervention is the Savvy Caregiver Program that um, 
that Laura so kindly mentioned. Um, I do not have any um, conflicts of interest to, to declare. And I'm very grateful to the National Institute <clears throat> uh, uh, on Aging for support uh, for work on Savvy and also for the uh, Roy Ball Center that Joe mentioned. The, um, the um, address of the center is on this slide. Go check on it. We have a letter of intent um, uh, open right now and people might be interested in, in submitting for pilot projects. So I wanna talk about what is, an, what is a behavioral intervention? I think if we're going to talk about adaptation, implementation, fidelity monitoring, we got to know what we're talking about, or I, I need to know that for my for myself. So if, as far as I can think of it, I think it consists of a behavioral um, intervention consists of uh, there being a theor theoretical framework or basis for the intervention. There ought to be a behavioral objective. It's going to intervene. <laughs> on behavior, you might want to have an outcome behavior in mind. I think you have to have core principles or tenets for the intervention. Uh, what is it about? There has to be a mechanism of change, a mechanism of behavior change. How does this intervention work? <clears throat> and there needs to be, at least in the savvy model, an intentional structure, a curriculum that's composed of constituent and contributing parts. That's not to say it can't be flexible. I think Laura's, uh, Dr. Gitlin's notion of their flexibility, I think is, is really critical. And I don't think in, in my example, there's, there's too much um, a problem with, with flexibility, but I'm gonna get to that. So let's talk about a model. We, we uh, think of caregiving as being a stress con condition. People who provide care are under stress, okay? And we use um, the social cognitive theory that uh, Al Bandura and Susan Folkman and Lazarus and Perlin have developed really over the last 40 years at least. Um, and the model essentially says, if you are going to have a good outcome here, then you have to have appropriate ways of coping with the stress. And there are, there are ways of coping uh, that are problem focused that often lead to positive outcomes and others that are emotion focused like um, denial that lead to negative uh, outcomes. And within the theory, there are two very important uh, concepts, primary and secondary appraisal. Primary appraisal is that the person understands what's going on, understands the nature of the stress. And the secondary appraisal is, I can handle this. I, I can master this situation. And so within this model, developing a fund of knowledge to improve understanding, development of skills to um, <clears throat> handle various parts of the stress situation and development of mastery, the sense of self-efficacy, competence, confidence, what have you. When, when things come along, even if I haven't seen them before, I'm gonna be able to handle it. When those are, when that secondary appraisal is strengthened, then when some challenge comes, the coping is problem focused. Oh, I know this, I know what to do with it. Here, I'm, here's how I'm gonna handle it and so on. So that's the model. We have a theoretical model that is absolutely essential to the Savvy Caregiver uh, program. We have a behavioral objective. The caregiver is gonna be able to frame and enact problem focused coping behaviors to manage stress situations that day-to-day -day dementia caregiving produces. So it's not that they're gonna have one little set, one set of skills for handling one set of problems. It's gonna be that they have a kind of a meta set of skills for handling what happens every day uh, when guiding the life of a person living with dementia. 
Now the program also has some very core principles. The first is that caregiving is a new life role and that it is essentially clinical in nature. We think of, of uh, caregivers the way those in my school think of nursing students. Um, those in, in Laura's school think of health, health science students. Those in medical schools think of medical students. These are people going from beginner to expert in a clinical realm. So that's a principle about the caregiver. Two principles, sorry, two principles that are really fundamental to the program are that as far as um, the person living with dementia is concerned, her personhood persists for the duration of her life. That person is still there. The dementia is taking away her capacity to relate to herself and to others, but she's still there. And she's able to become involved in day-to-day -day activities in a way that is pleasurable, engaging, um, so long as those activities fit her present capacity. And the last key principle, it goes back to the caregiver, self-care is essential. She is the, the caregiver is the instrument of the care recipient's well-being. Keeping the instrument in tune is fundamental. Ken, I'm sorry to interrupt briefly. I, I think there's like a background noise on your end. It almost, I don't know if it's uh, something is tapping, like when you're speaking. I know it's not you banging your hand on the table, but yeah, it's some kind of like sound. You know, what, you know it's my, it's me rocking back and forth on a chair. Oh, it's your chair. Okay. I will sit oh. as still as possible. Thank right? you. I know it's hard. It's, it's, it's exciting hard. material. But. It's hard to sit still and move my hands, you know. I know. Use my Thank hands you, to Jeff. talk. That's okay, so <laughs> thanks, Joe. I appreciate that. To continue the example, we do have a mechanism of change, and it comes out of social cognitive theory. Bandura, you know, started out with, with phobias, people who are afraid of snakes and spiders and flying. And he used three fundamental strategies, and these are ones we use. Instruction, providing information, giving knowledge, um, then application, graduated application to um, face up to the, the challenges and being successful and being coached with those applications. And then vicarious success, seeing others who are in the same situation also successfully apply the principles and, and practices or strategies that are being taught. And that's what we do in, in Savvy. So that we have a deliberate structure that starts with a developing the fund of knowledge. So the first couple of sessions, a lot is devoted to, this is what happens as a result of a dementia illness. This is what happens to the person. And then we begin to, to talk in terms of how does the person behave and how do you enter into the pattern of behavior uh, and guiding the behavior of the person. And all along, we're providing essentially home, uh, homework, asking people, take what you've learned in this session and apply it to caregiving, come back and report on it and receive coaching as well as feedback and watch others um, who've, who are applying things at home. Over the course of the six weeks of the normal savvy, increasing time is given to this report back on application and coaching. Think about how we train nurses and doctors, just what happens. First two years of med school, <clears throat> classroom. Next two years, you're out there seeing, being involved more and more in clinical practice, being tutored, coached, getting feedback, getting encouragement, developing skills, developing confidence, competence, and a sense of mastery to go on to the residency program. That's what we're doing in Savvy, trying to work on that kind of mastery development. Now, that's the core program. And, and, I, and Laura made this key point about it. behavioral interventions need to be culturally, environmentally relevant. So we think, uh, we believe fundamentally that 
caregiving occurs in context. It could be sociocultural context, could be environmental context, what have you, but it, it has to be relevant, whatever the behavioral intervention is, to the person's uh, context for, for providing care. So the challenge is how to fit an evidence-based program like Savvy to a particular context. The first principle is it's got to involve collaboration with the program developers. Um, Just interrupt. Uh, there's about a minute and a half left. So, um, say again? Uh, excuse me to interrupt. About a minute and a half left. Please. Thank you. Um, so collaboration with the developers, you can't just say, oh, look, at here's an interesting program. Let me tinker with it and I'll change it and we'll make it relevant to you know, people in, in Southern Georgia or Northern Minnesota. Uh, that's just not the way it's done. You gotta start with the understanding the framework, the principles, the objective, the strategies, and after that, mold the surface elements to fit the context and possibly add or, or modify some of those principles. I can tell you over 20 years, there has been enormous drift in savvy in terms of the adherence to the framework or the principles, why not? And as far as I'm concerned, if it's not about achieving mastery in the caregiving role, if it gets turned into an, oh, well, here's an informational program, if it's not emphasizing the development of skills and mastery, it's just kind of here's some information. If it's not an active learning program, but oh, I'm going to give you lectures. And if the leaders haven't been trained appropriately, that's not savvy caregiver. But you know, we've found that copyright, trademark, and the use only with permission seem to carry no weight in the world. The practice out there seems to be, gee, Whatever's yours is mine, and I can do it whatever I will. And that's, um, that's a good way to sort of kill programs. Last, our solution, we've, got, we've finally arrived at certifying and recertifying savvy leaders. We do have an online training program. We are, and John will talk about this, about to engage a licensure and relicensure program to ensure that the program is maintained with fidelity. And with that, I have done. <laughs> Thank gonna... you so much, Dr. Hepburn. That was wonderful. Really appreciate your time uh, and sharing your insights. For those of you that are here from public health agencies, you've just heard two prime examples of evidence-based interventions in dementia caregiving that have been successfully disseminated and implemented. And I think both developers here are enthusiastic to do so even more. Those of you that are advancing your state plans in dementia and dementia caregiving, um, again, let us know how we can help forward this work in your particular uh, locales, communities, et cetera. So next we have John Hobday. Uh, I have collaborated with John now for, I wanna say at least 16 years. And mm -hmm. one of the exciting things John has done has really helped to facilitate widespread dissemination and potential adoption of evidence-based dementia care innovations. And John is going to share how he's done that vis-a-vis -vis the use of uh, really exciting technological uh, mm -hmm. tools. So please, John. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'm John Hobday. Uh, I'm the president of Healthcare Interactive and a uh, uh, partial owner in Savvy Systems LLC. But um, today I'm gonna to talk about, I think an important aspect um, of evidence-based programming and that's dissemination and ongoing, ongoing use and how CARES, um, a, a, a series of online training programs that I've developed can serve as a model for other um, evidence-based interventions. So in terms of conflicts of interest, I am the owner of Health Interactive and a partial owner in Savvy Systems. Uh, okay, so Health Interactive, just a little bit of a background. Um, I've been around for 25 years. We do online training for healthcare workers, direct care workforce uh, in the areas of Alzheimer's and dementia specifically. Uh, we've developed over this period of time, 10 courses over 50 hours of curricula. Um, I've uh, had, uh, and, and oh, great thanks to NIA for 20 years of, of funding. I have published 20 journal articles, have developed a five-step method to dementia care, 
a very structured certification and credentialing program. And I think really importantly, have trained 350,000 direct care workers throughout the US and Canada, more than 1.5 million modules completed with an impact to care of uh, more than 10 million people living with dementia. So I'm gonna uh, talk about a few things today, developing a licensing model. So I'm really focused on dissemination in this particular presentation, copyright and trademarking, and why I think it's important, defining licensing inclusions and exclusions, ensuring impact to fidelity, promoting sustainability. And then um, I'll, uh, Ken alluded, to, Dr. Efren alluded to this a bit, but I'll apply all of that to work we're doing with Savvy Caregiver. So the first um, point I'd like to make for uh, evidence, other evidence-based um, programs is, uh, you know, develop a licensing model. I, our goal is, uh, you know, how can we make sure that Savvy Caregiver is gonna stick around for the next 25 years? Licensing model, uh, I, I believe will we'll ensure that. For CARES, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have a licensing model. We have authorized use of CARES training and materials. It's all copyrighted. We have a pricing structure, 99 a person, 159 uh, automatic discount. We have a single site unlimited use license. We discount for two programs or more. And the important thing here is not the numbers. The important thing here is it's a structure. It's set, it's flexible. It works for um, different organizations, no matter what their needs are. Number two, really important point that I think is often overlooked is the importance of copywriting and trademarking all materials and marks. So while we, uh, CARES, has uh, copyrighted all materials, videos, et cetera, training programs over the years, we've also gone out of our way to uh, copyright and register word marks for both the company and the product name, as well as design marks. So Healthcare Interactive with the knot design and CARES with the leaf design. This is often overlooked, I think, especially in academic circles, and I would make the argument it's excessively important. Um, we've defined inclusions and exclusions for licensing. So our customers or users or organizations, what can they do? What can't they do? For us with CARES, they can access the CARES training program. They can project CARES up on a screen as a direct uh, dementia curriculum, but they can't copy it, let's say, into a PowerPoint. They can access a free certification program for all staff for each program, and they can make use of many materials and downloads that we allow. But we also have some important exclusions. They can't copyright any of the material or use it as their own. They can't use our logos without written authorization. And they can't advertise CARES without our authorization as well. We give that authorization. We just want to see what's going out there before it actually goes out. Um, we believe this has a positive impact on fidelity. So I, CARES has a defined curriculum, certification process, and credentialing process. Um, it's standardized training material and a distribution platform. And importantly, and much differently than other um, dementia interventions, drift doesn't occur because we're asynchronous. The same video about Marianne and her caregiver, Sita, with a, a really explosive um, shower uh, scenario um, is fixed. So if I, if I talk about that in the state of Michigan or the state of Louisiana, people know exactly what I'm talking about. They have a fixed, all those 350,000 people have a fixed idea of what that example is and you can refer to it. There is no reliance with CARES on individual trainers or interpretation of concepts. So our five-step method, while easy to remember and easy to learn and easy to implement, has nuances. And I'm not relying on um, someone who's been trained by someone who's been trained by someone to get that method across. And in process uh, is case write-ups for our credentialing program, which is our 40-hour full program. And finally, sustainability uh, cares again is asynchronous defined and it's scalable. I could bring 10 times the customers on tomorrow. Um, we do update it regularly for sustainability purposes to meet new state regs. Um, content and videos are updated depending on uh, current topics. Um, technical updates, for example, when Flash disappeared at the end of 2020. Um, new products are developed, such as a mental illness version that we've just launched and a Spanish language version. And I think point number four is maybe one of the most important I can make. Long-term sustainability with CARES 
<clears throat> is very likely due to one important thing and that's an ongoing revenue stream. In order for the product line to survive, someone's got to answer the phone, someone's got to provide customer service, someone's got to be on chat, someone's got to be there to answer questions and to help with training and uh, the revenue stream that is built in with CARES does that. So just as a summary, develop a licensing model, really pay close attention to copyright and trademark, define those licensing inclusions and exclusions, or at least think about them. What would we, you know, what's the ideal? And that'll help you um, impact fidelity and help promote sustainability. That's part one of the presentation. Part two is um, applying that to savvy caregiver and our work with, uh, with, Kent, with Dr. Hepburn. So um, we partnered, I originally partnered with the copyright holder of Savvy Caregiver, University of Minnesota in 2008. By I, I mean Healthcare Interactive for some electronic versions of Savvy materials that I, uh, our company had developed. Um, and that has been in place since until this year when we created a new company, Savvy Systems. And uh, that license agreement was reassigned from Healthcare Interactive over to Savvy Systems and now also includes uh, Emory University. We developed a licensing model. I'm going down my, my points here and applying to, to Savvy. Developed a licensing model. So we created a flexible licensing model that we think is flexible enough for the variety of users and versions of Savvy that are, are being used and out there. The state of Michigan is much different than a home care that happens to be delivering this locally um, for family members. We established a home for licensing, SavvyCaregiver.com. We standardized Savvy Caregiver uh, leader training, as Ken said, with an online training program that's finishing up its evaluation will be published and available in 22. We copyrighted and trademark. So um, if you Google, we did this just this week, if you Google images for Savvy Caregiver, you get, uh, yeah, I, I would say hundreds even of logos and treatments for Savvy Caregiver. In the absence of a standardized brand, your, your users and implementers will come up with their own. They, the, of course, they would want to. I want to promote this for Savvy Caregiver Thursday nights and during the month of November. And there's no standardized brand. And so I'm going to come up with something. And there are balloons and hearts and any number of things. So by establishing this brand, we now have something that we can just give organizations. It will really simplify. We've registered and we're approved for a registered trademark with Savvy Caregiver. Uh, through the trademark office. We continue to copyright um, uh, and, and create new authorized versions of manuals. And we've started to make it clear um, increasingly that Savvy Caregiver is not in the public domain and cannot just be used without attribution or without permission or without a licensing agreement. This is the challenge that Dr. Hepburn talked about. So again, in the absence of structure, people will do what they do. But with structure, it's, it not only allows, um, it, it just takes away a lot of the guesswork. Um, so let's talk about inclusions and exclusions. So what can a licensee or a customer or an organization using savvy materials or, or programs do and what they can't do? Uh, number one, they can use authorized versions of the materials and branding. They have authoriz authorization to do that. Uh, the authorized manuals, the PowerPoints, and the videos. They also um, get access to a new members-only area on SavvyCaregiver.com, which gives them members-only um, updated materials, free ongoing webinars, uh, follow-up trainings. And this, I'll talk about this in a bit, but this really helps build what we hope is a much more integrated and, and together community of Savvy practitioners. These are just a couple of the inclusions. What are a couple of the exclusions? Um, users or organizations, licensees cannot incorporate savvy materials into other efforts without permission or attribution. They can't use alternative branding of savvy caregiver and they can't independently distribute uh, savvy materials or trainings. <clears throat> We believe this will have a huge impact on fidelity with Savvy Caregiver. By implementing a licensing agreement, by defining these structures, inclusions, exclusions, um, you know, we're, we're giving that structure. One, one important thing though that we've, we've come up with is to eliminate master trainers to help develop 
uh, to help um, limit drift. When I talked about CARES, you know, someone training, someone who's then been trained, who's been trained, someone leaves the organization, which happens. So now a, a master trainer trains someone is training the next person. You have no idea um, whether those trained, trained, sub-trained people are meeting the same um, knowledge and skills as would have been achieved with your authorized trainers. So- Excuse me, John, um, Excuse me, John. just about a minute left. Okay, thank you. Yep, alternatively creating a process uh, for master trainers to uh, demonstrate that knowledge and skills. Um, to promote sustainability, um, you know, build strong partnerships with the tech transfer office is uh, what we have been doing, um, licensing and a revenue model to have ongoing program development, staffing and training, create a commercialization model, which we did, and create a structure to bring savvy, uh, savvy licensing together as a community. So here's my conclusionary note and thought for all of you that licensing, copyright, trademark protection, fidelity and sustainability structures will actually allow your evidence-based program to survive and grow long-term, which is what we're kind of all wanting. No one wants to see 20 years of work, uh, you know, not, not continue to be valuable and not continue to grow. And as Dr. Gitlin said, if it takes 25 years for um, interventions to really come into their own, these are important considerations. Hope that's helpful and happy to take questions in a bit. Yeah, this is great, John, and uh, for Dr. Hepburn as well. And, you know, I realize I mentioned in the chat, we're going to save questions at the end, but there's there are no, multiple questions coming up from attendees that I think John and Ken it may be good to address now. I think we have plenty of time as well for Erin uh, uh, too, uh, for her important final talk. So I wanted to start with uh, Loretta Hewer. you had raised your hand. I'm gonna allow you to talk. Why don't you go ahead and share your question for Dr. Hepburn and, and John, Mr. Hobday, and we'll be happy to address it. So uh, Loretta, please. I think you have to unmute yourself. Loretta, can you talk? I, I think that Loretta's question is it also in the Q and A as well, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, go ahead, Kim. Loretta's question, which is a terrific one, relates to the development of Savvy for Indian Country, <clears throat> and that that was that I think is a wonderful example of a really really well done adaptation mm -hmm. because. About, um, I don't know, eight to 10 years ago, <clears throat> um, a, a, a scholar at the, um, Neil Henderson, um, had working with the National uh, NICOA, Indian Council on Aging, or Council on Indian Aging, um, approached me and said, uh, that he, uh, in collaboration with NICOA, would like to develop an adaptation of SAVVY for a uh, use in, uh, in Native American communities. And we engaged in a very long and very um, detailed process of looking exactly at the principles, at the theory, at the structure of SAVVY, and then seeing how it could be applied and, and, and more importantly, tailored, particularly in the exercises and the illustrations um, to uh, Native American family caregivers. And I think the product of that uh, collaboration, so, so it really did start as a collaboration with my serving effect, effectively as a consultant to Neil and his leadership in the project, uh, a great collaboration leading to, I think, an effective adaptation. I am currently involved in, in uh, similar uh, co uh, consultation collaborations with um, Dr. Ishtar Govia uh, in, in, uh, in, in uh, Jamaica to do something about a collab uh, uh, Caribbean adaptation. I'm in involved with uh, Dr. Yuri Jang in uh, Los Angeles doing something with uh, low English literacy Korean uh, caregivers. All of these are, I think, great examples of very well thought out um, and conscious adaptation efforts. 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hepburn. We have another question here from uh, C. Wang. And so uh, C. Wang, I allowed, I've, I think you can talk here. If you unmute yourself, feel free to ask your question. And we are not getting it. Okay, while we're waiting for that, number of questions came through chat here as well, uh, Ken and John. Um, one that came up, and I think we've addressed this, is the certification as a process associated with the SAVVY program. Uh, this is from Nina Craig. And John, I think your presentation addressed that is essentially, there kind of is now, is, is that the case? Well, there had, well, and Ken, correct me if this is incorrect, there has not been one, but there will be one as a part of the new online training process that's being validated currently. Uh, uh, through evaluation um, uh, during the, the training program. So that's something that we are looking to build where it'll be a certified savvy caregiver, uh, group leader or trainer. Great, thanks, John. Um, other questions that came through here, uh, as you can see on the chat, uh, and this is from Ishtar, uh, Ken, is what does the savvy caregiver licensing model mean for the, those of us doing adaptation and impl implementation work in other countries, for example, such as what is going on now in Jamaica? I'm going to turn that one over to John. I, I think <clears throat> I wish that I had uh, had been part of this seminar 20 years ago and learned the lessons that Laura has learned about all this. And um, J John can tell you that uh, I've been um, uh, I've been struggling against uh, licensure a lot. And, but I'm fully, I'm fully committed to it at this point, although I'm not part of Savvy Systems. But I think we've had this conversation, John and I and the people at the University of Minnesota. At, licensure should not stop the process of adaptation. Adaptation is critical. Mm -hmm. And I think, though, John, speak if you can, because this may not be fully developed, the, the linkage between licensure and adaptation efforts. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Yep, um, and and for that, I would point back to Cares for Cares. There's a there's a clear there's a clear process. There's a clear, um, you know, kind of a one model for for everything. For Savvy, it's different though because there is ongoing research, which we certainly don't want to stifle. There are collaborative partners that are adapting and uh, translating programs. So, um, to specifically address the question. There is on the Savvy Caregiver website a get licensed form that really seeks to get the full picture of what um, a licensee and not, uh, you, you know, I think the, the person asking this question is involved with the research project. So that person kind of stands um, alone differently than maybe an implementer or someone who is um, commercializing Savvy in a different way. But there's a get license button on, on the website to try to gather information, come up with a flexible licensing model for it um, that, you know, is acceptable to University of Minnesota and is acceptable to, uh, to all involved. Uh, Dr. Gitlin, please, if you have your hand raised, want to raise questions. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in because we use a similar uh, model and uh, I find that agencies and individual providers want a licensure model because it spells out clearly that they were trained and they have the right to use it and then how to use it. I don't think, uh, Ken, my experience has not been any, uh, hasn't been that it prevents adaptations. I think it's, uh, you know, we have, we're very mm -hmm. clear what adaptations are allowed or not. And then after online training, we do virtual, um, uh, train, we do a virtual meeting to talk about what adaptations and, and to approve adaptations. So that the licensure has not really, um, you know, uh, deterred that. I, I think also licensure fits the way agencies think about things. So it's not a new thing for them. I think it's new maybe for us as developers, but it isn't for uh, practitioners or agencies. So I've never been questioned about it, but we follow a very similar uh, approach and this structure, I think, is is very important. I Great. just want I just want to add that the the um, adaptation process is so fundamental to the pursuit of new knowledge about caregiving. Mm -hmm. As adaptations occur, as the process occurs, we just learn more about the dimensions. And so, licensure, I think, in this case, is almost like a registration. You know, we're working with within the 
within this agreed space. Um, and, and, and we're going to do the adaptation collaboratively. That's how I feel about it. And, and I would just add to what both of you said, we've had a number of long time savvy implementers and, and, and uh, uh, developers who have come to us and said, we want to do the, we want to do the right thing. What should we do? What's the structure? What, you know, we'll live with whatever anybody else is living with, but you and tell us what that is. But again, in the absence of that structure or a licensing or, a, or you know, and that, that structure, it's really hard to answer the question and be, maybe um, fair across the board. And, and that, those can be really hard things to set up. They, uh, and, and, and I think it is, it's the way to ensure that programs survive the long-term. Wonderful. You know, just again, I'm sorry, I jump in here, but <laughs> I think the complexity is that uh, developers and development teams are not schooled in this. It takes a lot of thought and uh, there's, there's not much written in our world about this and how to do this. And the, uh, we're constantly doing environmental scans for program fee schedule and the licensure schedule. And if you find it on the website, that's great. Or you have to follow up with in-depth interviews or you have a wonderful seminar like this. Uh, but I think that's one of the issues that we don't school our next generation of intervention developers mm -hmm. that this is part of the you know the pathway towards dissemination and implementation great thank you um again my apologies for those of you that raised your hand i i, I click a button saying allow to talk but if you were unable to unmute yourself my apologies again type your questions into the chat and q a we'll get to them but we 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 really must now move on to aaron long um who will give a great i think wrap up to our uh really exciting presentation today, really going and, and, and moving in exciting in different directions. So uh, I will uh, hand it over to you, Aaron, and I think we're gonna need our slides up so they take up the whole screen. I don't know if you're controlling it, Elma, or Aaron is. Elma's co controlling it for me. Okay. Yes, can you see them? No, they, they come up where it's like a notes version, Elma. Oh. So well, let's get sorted out. I'll just introduce myself and say thank you guys for including ACL in this discussion. Um, this is work that we're extremely passionate about and have been since we began. Um, uh, I'm coming from a different perspective. Uh, we've begun, we began um, providing resources to support um, translation and implementation and scaling of evidence-based interventions um, in 2008. So um, we have been doing this for a while now. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, my talk is going to be about the translation and implementation of evidence-based, evidence-specific, dementia-specific evidence-based interventions. And with that, we'll go to the next slide. I just want to give you a little bit of background that what um, we at the Administration for Aging, on, on aging at the Administration for Community Living have been doing for a number of years. As I said, we've started um, doing evidence-based interventions uh, in 2008. We have a, currently have a program called the Alzheimer's Disease Programs Initiative um, through which we have been funding um, two different programs. We began actually funding um, supportive services through our Alzheimer's disease supportive services programs back in 1992. So we've been at it for a long time, but then we really started focusing on um, bringing the evidence-based uh, to, to service delivery in 2008 when we started funding the um, evidence-based, evidence-informed, and innovations in um, in dementia care uh, interventions. And in 2014, we, we stopped doing the innovations and we've been focusing on evidence-based and evidence-informed ever since. And, and what we the examples that we've had earlier today were so great because we at ACL have been funding Savvy and COPE um, for a number of years. So it's great to hear you know, their, their insights and their, their challenges and successes. Uh, at, in our evidence, in our state and community program, we are have you know a number of goals, but basically our main goals are to expand dementia capability across states and communities through through a single program, delivering uh, dementia specific evidence based and evidence informed interventions to support living people living with 
a dementia in their caregivers, as well as improving and expanding person-centered care. That's not a new term to any of us, but um, it's really, sometimes it's more challenging than you think to get people to um, recognize the, the importance of that and what it actually means to the people that live in their community. Um, and we also target our supports to those with the great, greatest social and economic need. At ACL, we are at AOA, we, are, um, we get our authority to do this work through the Older Americans Act, and that is um, a, a key uh, element of the Older Americans Act is that getting source resources and services to those with the greatest social and economic need. And we're also, we're, we're working super hard to um, support paid and unpaid caregivers through the provision, provision of education, training, and tools. Everybody knows that the, the direct care workforce is um, a key thing that needs to be um, supported and expanded uh, dramatically. In 2020, we actually started a new grant program uh, providing specific grants, dedicating specific funds to bring dementia capability to Indian country. I was um, happy to hear um, some of our grantees that are doing the Savvy Caregiver with Indian Country uh, work, uh, or they're getting ready to, and working with Dr. Henderson. Um, and these, uh, these grants are going to federally recognize tribes, tribal organizations, and, and targeting um, very similar activities to our, our state and community, but just having that specific pot of money set to the side for um, Native communities. And next slide. I just wanted to give you a good sense of actually where ACL is um, providing or uh, has provided is currently providing resources. We our grants we uh, don't give money to um, our our grantee pool is not organizations that are getting or new at this. Um, we have state and um, home and community based services grantees. There are state units on aging, the public health the so, and social service departments, county and city governments, the traditional aging network, area agencies on aging, councils on governments, ADRCs, the Aging and Disability Resource Centers. And then there's also specific um, Alzheimer's and related dementia service providers, hospital systems, senior centers, um, and even university-based service providers. So um, that's a long way of saying that uh, if you're providing home and community-based services to people living with dementia and their caregivers, our grant program is a wonderful vehicle to um, look at some evidence-based interventions. We do require everyone to implement uh, an evidence-based intervention with as part of their grant, an evidence-based or evidence-informed intervention as part of their grants. So um, that it's a great vehicle to um, get top test out and pilot some resource to programs in your communities. We're actually um, active right now in 32 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. And our grantees have um, since 2008 implemented 24 different evidence-based interventions and 12 evidence-informed. And you'll see as I go through this, um, it doesn't seem like big numbers, but it's it's a I've, because many people do a lot of the same things in different communities. Um, it actually is a huge amount of work. I, there was um, a new uh, database set up that, that they did a lot of research for recently by uh, called the Best Practice Caregiving. And they one of the things that they focused on um, that, you know, the savvy caregiver that you heard Ken and John talking about, uh, they found, they figured out that ACL had funded tens of thousands of people to um, in, in their training in delivery of the Savvy Caregiver Program, which was um, an amazing uh, <clears throat> finding that is good for everyone. So um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to give you a sense of some of the interventions that we have been funding over the years at ACL. Um, you will have heard of some of these, and obviously COPE and Savvy Caregiver are both on our list. Um, the wonderful thing that um, Laura didn't mention about COPE was that people are figuring out how to get um, reimbursed by Medicare for it. And through our grant program, we were able to um, work with, put some grantees that were doing the same work together, and um, they worked together to figure out the codes that would work, and, and we've created manuals on on you know, or a guidebook on um, getting your 
your, your intervention paid for. Sustainability is the key to all of this, whether it's the sustainability on the side of what John was talking about, those interventions that um, the, the licensing and getting that structure, but also there has to be sustainability on the other side where they can afford to pay for the licensing and, and the structure that uh, companies like John's company are, are making available. But you'll see that there are um, a tremendous amount of uh, a tremendous amount of opportunity out there for evidence-based interventions. The nice thing with um, ACL, what we do with when we talk about those modifications, uh, and much in our case at ACL, much of the modification is typically to bring cultural competence to to the interventions in, in the communities that we're serving. Uh, so that is an important time to work. For we, what we encourage our grantees to do is to work with the researchers to make sure that um, that they do maintain fidelity with the um, original intervention. Through the ACL funded programs, we also um, have very strict requirements for evaluation. And we, you know, I've, here I've provided a, li a list of some of, or some examples of the outcomes that um, our grantees have been um, evaluating their programs for. Typically, the way they do it is they align their uh, res their their outcomes and their evaluations to align with what the original researchers' outcomes were, which helps support that they're um, delivering with fidelity. And um, but also they get the evidence to be able to. Um, take that data that they get through their, their the evaluation that we pay for, take that, that um, data to other sources and say, this is why our community needs this. And, and here we've, we've proved, we've demonstrated the need and here's the data. And I'll tell you, it has worked out very well um, and with um, grantees being able to go to their state legislature and, and use the data to um, get more, more resources from the state to continue to serve people and expand services to people with uh, living with dementia and their and caregivers. Uh, next slide, please. So um, choosing the intervention is always the key. When we, we call for all these applications, people look at, um, there's, there's, it can be overwhelming the number of uh, opportunities out there. Uh, so there's a ton of de decisions that have to be made, and and it's and the key is to go into this making uh, making your informed decisions because you know your community and you ask the right questions and and but you also have to think about what's reasonable to do now and and will you be able to sustain it in the future? We think about I just threw on this slide a bunch of questions you know that you need to do before you decide what's the right intervention for your community and that will be the key of, to sustaining something if you bring something to your community that they're not interested in it, you you won't be able to um, to sustain it so you know you need to understand what's presently available in your community ask them what they want what they need find out i mean there's a lot of, of great um, information opportunities that are that are going across the mo movements across the nation, the Dementia Friendly America. People are gathering, getting together and it's organically happening in communities and they will tell you what they want. Um, what, have, what has been tried in your community in the past? Did it work? Did it not work? And if it didn't work, why? Could you try something again if you just tweak it a little bit and do it a little differently? And sometimes it really just comes down to building awareness of what you're doing. Um, and what you're making available. Um, <clears throat> one of the things Laura talked about is, is whether they have, you know, the, the professionals in the communities. If you if you're picking a, an intervention that's that is uh, requires an occupational therapist, you need to make sure you have occupational therapists in your community before you do before you bring that uh, intervention there. Um, so that's you know who's going to implement it. Who you know do you have the staff? Who's going to who are you going to train? Um, and what needs to happen to make the work be able to be sustained. So, um, <clears throat> you know, another in, important thing in your considering the, in, the, the intervention that you're choosing is, is it right for your community? Will it meet the needs? Does it have the cultural competence? Is it something that's been 
designed originally to be in an urban community, but you're a really, you know, rural or even frontier community, um, would it be possible to, to um, modify it or adapt it to meet the needs of the community? Um, who, who do you want to target? Are you gonna, you know, target serving caregivers, dementia caregivers specifically, or people living with dementia, a combination of the both? Can, do you have, um, <clears throat> How will they be? How will services be delivered? Is it something in person? Is it tel telephonic? Is it computer? Of course, with um, the pandemic, we learned a lot, and people be adapted to things that they wouldn't. They sort of previously had resisted, and we've learned a lot in the the, the value and the impact that those hybrid or uh, those uh, computer based uh, educational opportunities and support services have have evolved and you know you just need to figure out if that's right for your community uh it is that that's what they're they're interested in having but so these are just some questions we did actually at acl create a document for um our applicants to sort of the questions that they need to ask themselves the considerations and i have a link for that a little bit and a slide or two down but um so just, you know, when you're going to pick, choose carefully. With next slide, please. And you have about a minute left, Erin. Okay. So these are the resources that we have um, so that you can identify the right dementia-specific ev uh, evidence-based intervention for your community. As again, I have that a link to the choosing evidence-based, the considerations. We also at ACL have created a compendium of grantee um, implemented evidence-based and evidence-informed interventions. So that 24 of them, I think was the number that I told you about before. All of we have a, in this document is a table that it has all of the, um, it has links to the literature that how, you know, who to contact to find out more information about it. Just giving you some uh, basic information. I also have a link here for best practice caregiving, which is a wonderful um, resource out of the Benjamin Rose Institute. Then we also have some instruments for evaluating and then as well, just the bottom document is uh, a document on that sort of is telling the story of the ACL um, activities through our grant programs. Uh, next slide. So we have the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center. There's a ton of tools on there. That's where all those documents and other tools are. We've created over the years. It's what the tools that we, as well as our grantees have created and they're wonderful. I encourage you to uh, go there and, and check it out. Next slide, please. So looking ahead, ACL continues to have commitment to translating evidence-based interventions into community and supporting and training and care, caregivers and, and paid and unpaid caregivers. Uh, we, we're gonna keep working to translate the evidence-based interventions to support communities and bringing cultural competence and diversity and service delivery, and as well as evaluating and getting the, um, the data behind those interventions. And I think I have one more slide, just sort of giving you a heads up about an upcoming. So next slide is uh, a funding opportunity. Right now it's as a forecast. And this is just what we have um, out there at the moment, but it should be in the first of the year, there will be a funding opportunity. So, and please, if you have questions about it, it gives my information in there and you can go there and get it. And with that, I'm done. That was just wonderful, Erin. Thank you so much. I mean, this is a mental note for us in our center. Alma, I mean, we, we were deliberate in making this a 75 minute webinar. We didn't want to overburden people by getting overly zoomed out. Like I think many of us are at this point. That being said, we need to have these as 90 minutes. Um, I don't think 75 minutes are enough. There are so many questions here that, um, remain to be addressed. And unfortunately, we're not going to have time to do that. I encourage Ken, John, uh, Aaron, others, feel free to answer any of these questions vis-a-vis -vis the Q&A uh, function um, or, uh, you know, chat directly. We'd really appreciate it. And then Alma, if we can please compile all these questions and try to answer them after um, our webinar ends today, which we are at time. As I've mentioned in multiple times in the chat, the slides and the recording will be available on our website, bolddementiacaregiving.org, as is all of our other prior events and activities. If you 
your public health agency or organization are interested in adapting and implementing and disseminating evidence-based interventions such as COPE and Savvy Caregiver, please let us know. We have a technical assistance form on our website. We would be happy to work with you and serve as a liaison to your organization to, again, make this happen and make it successful. Um, we are thrilled that you took time out of your busy schedules to be with us here today. Again, what a great set of presentations. I learned so much. I really love the interface between the academic side, the business side, and then finally the funding side. And I think we're all working in this space together to again, get these programs to the people that can use them. Those of you that are in public health agencies, you are critical to this. Our center is here to help you achieve that objective. I hope all of you have a wonderful weekend. Please reach out to us if you have any questions and we're thrilled to work with you. Thank you to all our speakers, Dr. Gitlin, Dr. Hepburn, uh, John, Mr. Hobde, Ms. Long, Aaron. Again, it went as well as I could have expected. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, Joe. Everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks, Emma. Yep. Thank have, you. Have a great weekend. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for pulling it together, Joe.